welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Espe from the University of Cincinnati. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Joseph Dalmau. He is currently research professor at the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies in Idibab's Hospital Clinic, University of Barcelona, an adjunct professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as editor of the journal Neurology, Neuroimmunology, and Neuroinflammation. Dr. Dalmau delivered the George C. Kotzius lecture titled Antibody-Mediated Disorders of the Synapse. He discussed uh, the discovery of a number of neurological conditions uh, for which now there is an autoantibody uh, against the synaptic receptors. And uh, in fact, uh, it was uh, a marvel of a presentation that I would suggest any of the uh, listeners uh, check into the website and access it for further details. But we have Dr. Lamar with us and we're very thankful for his presence after today's delivery of the uh, George C. Katsias lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aspai. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, uh, and I want to start by uh, painting the big picture uh, as I uh, understood it from the, uh, the audience. And you created uh, this uh, perspective of uh, the uh, targets for antibodies both in the cellular level, the intracellular uh, more often paraneoplastic targets which uh, are non-pathogenic when we talk to antibodies, but then the opportunity of a number of targets for which you've been responsible in discovering that are not inside the cellule, uh, the, the, this at the cellular level, or not inside the, the, uh, the, the neurons, but outside of the neurons in areas where then the antibodies are presumably themselves pathogenic and therefore amenable to therapy. Give us a little bit of that uh, uh, perspective. Is that correct uh, or semi-correct? No, that, that's correct, 100% <laughs> correct. <laughs> and, um, well, this happens that after many years of working uh, as a neuro-oncologist and seeing the classical paraneoplastic neurologic complications, that many of them, not all of them, associate with antibodies against intracellular antigens, and they don't, most of the time, they don't respond well to treatment. Uh, uh, most of the work was done with my mentor, uh, Jerome Posner, who discovered most of these antibodies. So at some point, um, uh, you start seeing patients that have syndromes that are quite similar, but uh, everything was negative. And some of them were young women or young men um, without history of cancer, without uh, uh, also risk factors, for risk factors for cancer. And uh, these uh, studies initially uh, were negative for antibodies, and this was the initial uh, start uh, moving on to uh, look for antibodies that were not visible using these techniques that at that time were available. And it took many months, for example, to optimize the uh, tissue immunostaining that it seems ridiculous nowadays. <laughs> it's, it's quite easy to do it, but it took a long, a long time and this was the first step. And after that, essentially, um, everything unfolded the way that I showed today. Um, in the in the presentation, it, it is remarkable to think the process of discovery that you laid out in your presentation, where really it starts with a major question at the clinic, and uh, goes on from there in a way that is much more sophisticated. Of course, an expert has the opportunity of delivering the process in a way that makes sense to us all, but it's quite complicated. Yeah, but is this is the way that worked for us? So, as a clinician. Um, and as a neuro-oncologist, I always very interested in challenging, clinical challenging cases and uh, in that the diagnosis is not obvious and so on. So you see these patients and sometimes you don't have the answer, but you remember them. And sometimes you have serum and a spinal fluid and you remember that you have them. <laughs> and then after seeing, uh, you know, uh, one is one, two is two, three patients is a series. <laughs> 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 So after seeing a few patients, then um, you establish the linkage. So, and the linkage here is not genetic, it's just symptoms, um, and then similarity of the syndrome, and then finding that they have antibodies that look alike, 
and, and then you don't have the identity, and then this is the first step. But that's uh, how, how it works. Uh, we tried over the years to, to do the opposite. So in some way, that means that you have done work for a number of years, and you and your colleagues uh, that work on the same. So you have uh, a laboratory with many samples of patients, and then sometimes you say, okay, why don't we go to the lab and pull out the cases that have atypical immune staining and so on, and then for us it never worked. It works sometimes, you find one, but it never worked in this way. It works better when it comes from the clinics. Right. And you have, y you have selected the group of patients that you know or you have a strong intuition that they are going to have the same. So if they have an antibody, they have the same disease. A and this is how it started. Yeah. When I was a resident, the most common limbic encephalitis was uh, HSV encephalitis. And you changed that tremendously. So that no longer is the uh, most common encephalitis. We cannot imagine a world uh, that uh, is without the discoveries that have uh, been uh, proposed, uh, advanced by, by you and your, uh, your team. In, in, in fact, uh, NND receptor antibody encephalitis is uh, perhaps, perhaps the most common of the conditions. Can, I cannot think what happened to the patients before you gave us the opportunity to diagnose them. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, these patients, uh, some of them died. Some of them recovered spontaneously. This happens with any type of autoimmune encephalitis. And some of them were treated empirically and uh, they got better. So I have anecdotes of in all directions about that. And particularly at the beginning of the discovery of this, uh, just, just imagine you, you have uh, identify, for example, a disorder, and, and it takes a long time before people start knowing about that. So then you have the opportunity to see how people think about it. And you have, you, you see, or you study patients or cases in that they have already died. And uh, they some of sometimes uh, even the family thought that there was nothing else to do and the support was discontinued. Uh, everyone in agreement. And uh, then later on you find that these patients had, this disease could have been uh, the possibility to, to uh, you know, to survive. We, we, we don't know. Right, then some may have survived. Uh, yeah, then there are patients in that, uh, in that they spontaneously recover. So uh, all, all this uh, spectrum of possibilities is there. And, uh, uh, and, and then many times people we do all of this, uh, you know, when you d don't know what the patient has, then you exclude all the possibilities and that can cause harm, but then you use immunotherapy sometimes because you think it's autoimmune, inflammatory, and then some of these patients improve. So I think that this is what happens. Yes. From your plenary session, uh, you've uh, emphasized the importance of having antibodies as a research tool, which uh, was then exemplified by very elegant uh, studies on the NND8 receptors and what uh, we could learn about memory. That's fascinating to me, and I, for that, will then refer the audience to your presentation. I myself plan to uh, go through it a couple of times to ensure that I have all the messages as best as I can, but here is my question on a more personal level. Of the 11 conditions that you identified uh, as relatively recent uh, comers to the field of neuroimmunology. Uh, outside of NND8 receptor antibody encephalitis, because that's the one that you've devoted the bulk of your research on, which do you think are next in the uh, therapeutic uh, promise? The ones that you think not, not only might be amenable for treatment with immunomodulatory therapies, but more specific with the targets that they affect? Well, I think that for some of them, um, you perhaps don't need really very much uh, additional type of therapies beyond immunotherapy because they respond faster to treatment. At the, at the long run, perhaps not better than the MDA receptor encephalitis, but for some of them, for example, the LGI-1, they respond faster. Um, and again, it doesn't mean complete, but uh, substantially uh, 
good improvement of symptoms. And then, so for these ones, uh, perhaps uh, an additional treatment would be great, but perhaps we have to prioritize things and it's not so important. For the MDR receptor encephalitis, I, I, I don't know how to explain very well the mechanism. I tried to uh, speculate today, and I think that there is some support in my speculations. The, the, the thing is that patients have symptoms for a very long time, and they have to be in the hospital, in the ICU for a very long time. And, and for this, it's really very important to, to, to have a complementary type of treatment based on the physiopathology. And, and, and you, you, you can go one by one, uh, the AMPA receptor encephalitis or the GABA B receptor encephalitis, all of these are quite very pure limbic encephalitis most of the time, not always. And in these ones also they respond faster. And if the patients have a tumor, they have to treat the tumor. Uh, but I think it's very interesting to understand the mechanism, not only to develop treatments, but to find out um, some way how the brain works and how the yeah. synapse work and, uh, and uh, the, the antibodies are a great resource for that because they are very um, disease-related and you can use them then as, as tools, you know. Yeah, absolutely. A patient comes into the hospital with a diagnosis of herpes simplex virus encephalitis. It's treated, goes home, returns to the hospital seven to ten days later with a movement abnormality and an encephalopathic state. Yeah, th this uh, basically uh, almost 95% of certainty will have an MDR receptor antibodies that have been treated for by herpes encephalitis. And this is now about the percentage of these. I can be precise actually here with the percentage. I cannot be precise with other things, but with the, let, me, right. let me allow to them to do that because we are, we, we are carrying a study now in uh, Spain uh, with, um, uh, th I believe it's around 30 something, uh, I don't know, 32 uh, institutions or prospective follow-up with patients with herpes encephalitis. So every, every patient with herpes encephalitis has been followed. Uh, it doesn't matter if, uh, if the patient develops uh, other symptoms or not because they are start the study at the beginning of with a viral encephalitis. So then 20%, which is a very interesting number, 20% develop later, a few weeks later, an autoimmune process, yes. But we, some we would think it's a recurrence of the herpes encephalitis, yeah. but may not be. No, and, and the other thing is that when the patients develop this relapse encephalitis that is autoimmune, uh, if they present like uh, acute presentation, that they're relatively easy to, the, to uh, you know, for an astute neurologist, they will think, well, this is a relapse of the, of the viral process, or this could be autoimmune, but you pay attention. The problem, and that's the most important thing, is that there are some patients in that they don't present like a peak of relapse. They present like a, a, a neuropsychiatric or psychiatric deterioration. And many times these patients are in, the, in rehab places and they attribute this to the viral process. And that's, that's a very important observation because if, if you suspect it's autoimmune, you can treat them. So the, the wrong thing to do would be to get the patients back in the hospital, give them antiviral therapy, as opposed to immunomodulatory therapy, on the assumption that the most likely explanation for their occurrence is the appearance of NMDA receptor antibodies in those who had herpes encephalitis mm -hmm. in the prior admission. Correct. For me, actually, if the patient goes back to the hospital, that's good, because somebody will figure it out, uh, what's going on. The problem is when the patient goes to rehab places that they do their best, cognitively deteriorate and, and they, everyone starts thinking, well, this had, you know, viral encephalitis, had necrotic lesions, um, that's, uh, that's what's going on. And uh, in, a, in a recent paper published in neurology, actually, we had some of these patients, it's very important, uh, ev even in our setting and suspecting this, uh, some of them were diagnosed when they came because of the protocol, they came to the hospital for a regular follow-up and then we thought, well, this patient is very different now from a few weeks ago when the patient was discharged from uh, the viral encephalitis. And this is well how we're picked up and the immunotherapy help. And uh, that's, um, that's a place that we can make a difference. Yeah.
just to then uh, wrap up our session, uh, I want to ask you, uh, there have been 11 new synaptic uh, mediated uh, autoantibodies discovered in just a few years. So clearly there are more that are looming in the horizon. What should we as clinicians think of when we see a patient that might potentially have an autoimmune disorder, particularly of the synapses compared to a paraneoplastic uh, type of uh, disorder? Well, th there are actually now 16 uh, <laughs> disorders. So it's, uh, it's, outdated, uh, it's outdated as of this morning. Uh, <laughs> 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 there, there, are, there are 16, um, and some very rare, some imp one impressed. So, I mean, um, well, when you see one of these patients um, and you suspect this, uh, you usually uh, rule out, you have rule out the usual culprits. The patient comes encephalitic. Let, let, let's imagine encephalitis, not a cerebellar syndrome, but, but uh, altered mental functions, uh, you know, uh, what you call encephalitis, encephalopathic, and acute encephalitis. So you basically you rule out the usual culprits, uh, viral, and, and you can do this in, in a couple, two or three days. Everything is ruled out. And then the next thing to do is look, for example, uh, the EEG and the MRI, and, and this can build up more the suspicion or not. And, and then, uh, depending sometimes, only knowing this, uh, sometimes you can already make clinically the diagnosis. And there is a paper in Lancet Neurology that uh, a large group of uh, researchers and uh, experts in the field we put together, and, and the idea was in some way, let's make the diagnosis without antibodies, not so dependent on antibodies. We did not exclude that, okay? They were running in the background but we are aware that in some places in the world, you don't even have in the entire country a lab doing that. And even when you have it, sometimes it takes two or three weeks to have the test. So many times in, in some of the main syndromes, you for example, limbic encephalitis, you, uh, classical limbic encephalitis, or NMD receptor encephalitis, classical presentation. Many times you can suspect the diagnosis and start the treatment, and then you can send the antibodies and if you are not very familiar with it, you can send a whole battery of antibodies. If you are very familiar, you can, you can sort of uh, narrow down a little bit. But you're saying, though, that if we encounter that scenario, that we might potentially consider immunomodulatory therapies before yeah. we have an, a specific antibody. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is what we do, and I think that that would be what, what I'm doing. And then the other thing with with encephalitis is it's just very important um, just keep serum and CSF, and the CSF is critical uh, for um, basically all these new type of uh, uh, antibody associated encephalitis in that the targets are on the cell surface. If you're looking for a classical paraneoplastic uh, antibody, th then it doesn't matter, like AGU or YO, that doesn't matter, serum or CSF. If you look at, for example, patients with ADEM that can present as encephalitis, although the target is the white matter, um, but uh, also white matter disorders and that they associate with aquaporin-4 or MOC, then this is better, the serum also, okay? And here is the serum. So serum for and CSF for classical or serum alone uh, for MOC or aquaporin uh, serum, but all the new ones, all these 16, you want to keep the CSF and the serum. The CSF is usually where help you very much. Keep CSF means frozen CSF? Yeah, when, well exactly you mentioned it, when the patients come to the hospital and everybody does tests and they do a spinal tap, just keep an aliquot of this and, 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 and then send it. Uh, just okay. establish as a policy, I mean, um, that's so because many of them have a spinal taps. Well, you were very gracious to accept this uh, uh, visit and, and I have to admit that uh, as I heard you speak and uh, at the end thank everyone uh, that uh, has given patience to you, I cannot think of myself that you, you were so kind, you're the very first patient that we suspected after coming from a meeting uh, that you had presented an NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis, you were so kind to, to, to uh, allow me to send the, the, the specimen to you and get the their, their results and it was fantastic. It was interesting convincing the OBGYN colleagues to take the uh, ovarian uh, teratoma. They, that wasn't something that they have ever heard of, so it seemed crazy, but crazy things are fabulous eventually, and you've uh, contributed to a lot of crazy, crazy things. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you.